Cause like a winter From where we are around the world, welcome and thank you for joining us. Today we're going to be exploring the world of directing. A great movie called Inequality by a producer named Jacob Kornbluth. But first, we have a special co-host, Manny Pacheco, who's also the host of Forgotten Hollywood on TherapyCable.com. He's going to introduce our guest today. Jacob Kornbluth is an award-winning writer and director of feature films, <clears throat> television, and theater. He has had three feature films premiere at the Sundance Film Festival, Haiku Tunnel, the Best Thief in the World, were narrative films, and Inequality for All. It was a documentary. Inequality, his most recent film, won the Special Jury Prize for Excellence in Filmmaking at Sundance 2013, did the best box office for an issue documentary since Waiting for Superman, and is out on DVD and streaming now. In 2014, he worked on the Showtime series about climate change, Years of Living Dangerously, that is executively produced by James Cameron, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Jerry Weintraub. His work on that show won an Emmy. Welcome, Mr. Cornblue, to The Circle. Thank you for having me. So this is a great movie, Inequality. I like that. It's a big topic. It really hits me at the heart because there's such a huge divide in America. And I hate to see that, and it's such a wonderful country that gives so much opportunity. So I really appreciate that you did the movie. It was a fabulous movie. Highly recommend it. We're going to show a clip about it right now. Now, the thing you ought to know about this Mini Cooper is it is small. We are in proportion, me and my car. My name is Robert Reich. I was Secretary of Labor under Bill Clinton. Before that, the Carter administration. Before that, I was a special aide to Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> of all developed nations, the United States has the most unequal distribution of income, and we're surging toward even greater inequality. 1928 and 2007 become the peak years for income concentration. It looks like a suspension bridge. Last year, we made 36000 I'd probably make 50000 a year, working 70 hours a week. The middle class is struggling. Now, people occasionally say to me, what nation does it better? The answer is the United States. In the decades after World War II, the economy boomed, but you had very low inequality. Do you know Robert Reich? I do, indeed. He's a communist. When I was a kid, bigger boys would pick on me. I think it changed my life. I had to protect people from the people who would beat them up economically. Who is actually looking out for the American worker? The answer is nobody. If workers don't have power, if they don't have a voice, their wages and benefits start eroding. We are losing equal opportunity in America. Any one of you who feels cynical, just consider where we have been. I hope you liked that clip as much as I did, because I love the movie as well. So, Mr. Cornbluth, first question. I'm sure you've gotten this about a thousand and one times. Why did you make the movie? <laughs> well, I made the film. Uh, it's Inequality for All, by the way, not just Inequality. Uh, but I made Inequality for All uh, because I cared about this stuff, because it was affecting me and my friends. I mean, a lot of the people I knew were what used to be called the traditional middle class, and they were struggling, struggling to make ends meet and struggling to sort of measure up to what they saw as the previous generation's easier ride. And they were looking for some kind of story to put it all into context, to understand why they felt the anxiety they felt economically. And um, I had heard a bunch of sort of theories about this, but they were all sort of based on whether you were conservative or liberal. And I wanted to make a story that I felt like was a holistic story that sort of um, put it all into uh, sort of a historical context and gave everybody sort of an explanation for what had happened. Um, and what turned out was if I started out as the first audience for this stuff, and this stuff started as short web videos and grew into a feature film, but these web videos had such an audience, there was such a hunger from people to get this information, this straight up content, and delivered it 
to them, not in the sort of uh, 24 hour news cycle, but in a big picture, something that connects the dots. Um, and it really makes us, puts together a holistic story. When I saw that there was such an audience for that, I knew that this film had to get made. So it was worth the struggle that it took me to, uh, to bring it to life. Fabulous. My apologies again. Inequality for All is the name of the movie. Question for you. Why Robert Reich? You know, it's interesting. Uh, he's a little guy fighting for a little guy is, is one of the things. You know, he's, um, he's uh, a small guy by stature. He's about 4 feet 10 or 4 feet 11. But it's amazing to watch him sort of speak and deliver this message. First of all, he can make complex issues easy for anybody, even me, to understand. And he, um, but it wasn't at all clear to me that he was going to be the only one in the movie when we started out. But what it turned out was I didn't want to do a sort of he said, she said movie. I wanted it to have one coherent story with one coherent vision. And I really felt like he had been talking about this stuff for his whole career, for 40 years. He'd been talking about income inequality and its consequences to the economy and a democracy. And I really couldn't imagine anybody better in the whole world to sort of uh, put this story together. It also turns out that a lot of economists aren't as funny as he is. And he, <laughs> he has a real sense of humor. And it's it was... When you're talking about an issue like income inequality, a lot of times people would be afraid that it'd be like a bunch of charts where they're taking their medicine. And I knew I wanted to make a movie that was fun, that would reach people as a sort of narrative, and he was the perfect vehicle for that as well. Yeah, did, did you? Uh, did he ever mention bringing on Stephen Moore? I think it's his arch nemesis. Oh yeah, <laughs> no, he, he didn't bring up that one, but there were many other arch nemesis that he's built up a fair amount of them over the years. <laughs> yeah, he has. What was the most interesting part as you were making the movie that really stood out for you? Well, I got to say, uh, what turns out to be the kind of spine of the movie is him lecturing in class. And I didn't realize how impacted I'd be uh, by looking at the faces of 18-year-olds thinking about what their economic future is going to be. But as I watched uh, these kids sort of take in this information and think about what it meant for them, uh, I got both worried for them, and also I got sort of more hopeful. I got to think, like, uh, maybe there's, um, they weren't as cynical as some of the people my age are in, in one way, and they were also deeply worried about this stuff and wanted to engage. So I didn't actually see that coming. I didn't know that that was going to get me, but I wound up making the film more hopeful than I thought I was going to when I started. So that was a big part of it. I want to bring Manny in here for a second. Manny, you, you, your show, Forgotten Hollywood, talks a lot about the impact of Hollywood on society. So now that we're listening to Mr. Cornbluth here and that wonderful movie, Inequality for All, what do you see? Well, I, the thing that, I, that, that strikes me is that you saw the inherent drama of these youngsters as they're about to approach their future. It's much like the movie Boyhood, if you think about it, how you can create drama out of just everyday life. Can you can you speak to that uh, some more? Because that fascinated me that you said that the lectures actually uh, were, were exciting and, and seeing the, the faces and how they respond actually creates a, a drama and impact for your documentary. Well, I, first let me say for anybody who hasn't seen the film, it's not a lecture, it's a movie, so don't feel like you're going to have to sit through an hour and a half of a guy <laughs> talking to you and screen graphs. It's a fun movie, surprisingly. And uh, if I could just say, one of my proudest moments is when the film premiered at Sundance. Um, at the end of the movie, I asked anybody if they had any questions, and the first hand that went up said, I can't believe I laughed and I cried at a film that I thought was about the economy. Did anybody else have that experience? And they sort of turned around and asked the audience, and all these people sort of sheepishly raised their hands. So, um, <laughs> so you know, first and foremost, let me just start by saying I believe that films should be entertaining, and you should be able to sit down and watch a movie for an hour and a half that takes you on a journey. A film's a transformation machine, and, and, and watching a movie's always been what is sort of a sacred temple for me, a place to kind of go in and hopefully come out changed in some way. Uh, and I don't think of it as a platform for just, you know, advocacy. Um, but, yeah, the students' faces, you know, young people's faces are so powerful. You know, uh, you, you just look at them and I, I, I was just dreaming my way into what they're worried about, what they're thinking about as they hear this stuff. And um, it also gave us a way from a purely film perspective to talk about, um, to see him talk about this stuff without having it feel like it's a lecture given to you as an audience. You can watch the students' 
experiencing the lecture and see how this kind of, he's kind of like a rock star professor. Kids are sitting in the aisles and swinging from the rafters. They're just fighting to get into this classroom. I mean, <laughs> anybody who had an education like I did where, you know, you were fighting to get out and not into the classrooms <laughs> is going to be just shocked that education can be this fun. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, it really was powerful to watch and see how, how it affected them. And it gave me a lot of insight into how to follow the film. Because one thing you don't know as you watch a documentary is, I didn't know where this film was going. I didn't know that I was going to use the classroom or any of the characters that we use from the 1% uh, wealthy guy to the middle class people until I met the people that I thought were compelling and decided to sit down and talk to them. So it's an incredible joy as a filmmaker to be able to kind of follow your nose and see what really affects you as the story unfolds in front of you. And I, that's what I really love about making documentaries. Now, let me ask you about the idea of presenting your film at Sundance and other film festivals. It seems that that might be the way to go as far as the 21st century platforms for presentation of documentary, feature films, animated films, short subjects. Um, did, it, did you find this to be the, the right platform for you? Well, you know, over my uh, career, my career trajectory, film festivals have played a crucial role in uh, being able to take more risky material, material that doesn't go through the kind of multiplexes of, of uh, all over America, um, and convince people that there's an audience for it. You sit down uh, at a festival like Sundance or the LA Film Festival or Tribeca in New York or whatever festival it may be. And a lot of times you don't know what you're going to see. When you're watching a movie in a multiplex, you've seen the ads, you've seen the trailers, you sort of know what's up. So it's a, it's a sort of unique experience. You're watching something without sort of having any biases against it. You haven't heard that uh, Angelina Joe Lee's in this film or you know whatever <laughs> actors are in it. And you sit down and you have an experience with, an, with a story that feels kind of fresh and new. I, I know. I know for a fact that Whip, Whiplash was, you know, started in the film festival circuit. Now it's nominated for best picture. So, are you seeing that this is the way to go for for projects? For projects like Whiplash, for projects like Inequality for All, for projects like um, like uh, Fruitvale Station, um, which was the previous year's film, they all started, including mine, at Sundance and won some awards at Sundance and then sort of uh, found an audience that way, and then became part of the sort of national discussion. So for my career and for people of my generation, it's been an entry point in for what you call more ambitious material than maybe you're seeing um, in your multiplexes. And it continues to be that. It's, it's a complicated process with all of its, you know, kind of insider trading and bad stuff that every other... <laughs> Uh, arena of, of life has, but it's also an incredibly valuable tool for people like me trying to tell stories that we feel are kind of uh, ambitious and that uh, that sort of reach, I think, a little deeper than some of the sort of traditional Hollywood fare. Hello, my name's Matt and I'm an addict. My mom was addicted to prescription pills when I was very young, before I even turned one. Are you or someone you know struggling with alcohol or drug addiction? Has everyone given up on you or your loved one? The caring staff at Elite Care understands and treats you as a whole person. We offer individual and group therapy, holistic healing such as yoga, nutrition and spirituality, medication management and PTSD treatment. By building upon your strengths and rebuilding broken bonds, we help you begin a successful life. With our staff of licensed psychotherapists and doctors, you can be assured of the highest level of care. Elite Care is the best option for long-term rehabilitation from drugs and alcohol. Contact 888-511-0607 for more information. Let's take a look at the director for a minute. <clears throat> so what are some of the psychological challenges you had while you were making the movie? You were talking about uh, earlier that you didn't know if you could do it. I think if it was it was two years it took you to make the movie, and you were way down here looking on top of that hill. You couldn't see the other side. What were some of the challenges? Well, I want to, if you hadn't seen the movie already and somebody came up to you and said they needed some money to make a movie explaining the economy, um, I don't know if many people have heard a more boring pitch than that in their lives, and it was very hard <laughs> to raise money for this project. Because, 
it's such a big thing, right? How do you explain the economy? Um, so imagine you're me and you have a two and a half year process ahead of you with no guarantee that anybody's ever going to see what you produce at the end of the day, no guarantee that anybody's going to fund this project, and you feel passionately you want to make this thing. How do you climb that mountain? Um, in this case, it was my first ever documentary. I had never made a documentary before, and uh, I um, didn't have any economic training, any formal economic training. I was just a concerned citizen who was worried about the economy and which way it was going and thought I could apply my storytelling skills. But if I told you there was, you know, if you asked me what was the time when I felt doubt or confused or worried, I would say just about every day in the process. It was an incredible challenge, maybe the biggest challenge of my life. Every single day I woke up worried that I wasn't going to finish the film or that nobody was going to watch it or that, you know, wouldn't find an audience. So you can imagine how gratifying it was to me to know that it's played all over the world now. And in theaters all over the country and it did fantastic box office for a documentary and people are watching it like crazy streaming and I get emails still every day from people saying thank you for making this film it makes it makes it worthwhile in retrospect but if you imagine where I was when I started um, it's just all a struggle I can tell you that much that's one of the reasons I love interviewing directors or writers because you really have an understanding of human behavior and you try to express it through your movies or whatever form you use, whether it be a book or whatnot. Um, <clears throat> what are some of the things that really hit you after the movie? I know you talked about one, the lecture class. Is there anything else after the movie or that really, yeah. wow. Yeah, there's, well, I mean, there's one particular character in one particular scene. It's, uh, it's a guy at a union rally who says uh, some version of, uh, uh, I think, the company's paying me more than I deserve to be paid, and he is fighting yeah. against sort of a pushing for his own economic self-interest. And I remember both feeling at that time when we were shooting how kind of uh, charged the environment was. There was a lot of like hostility and sort of suspicion right under the surface, which I was palpable in the room. And I remember hearing that guy speaking and thinking, um, thank you for saying that because a lot of people feel that way. They de they, they, they're worried that they're being paid more than they're worth. They feel some doubt about, they feel a lot of confusion over, uh, over their own economic sort of situation. And it comes out as doubt, personal doubts. They feel it as a personal failure. And I remember that really hit me when we were filming the movie. And, uh, and that was a, a moment that will probably stick with me forever. I mean, that's one of the joys of working on a film like this is you, you you get to be in places that you wouldn't have any right to be otherwise. How I got to be in that room and holding the camera was, um, uh, you know, just complete fortune. So, um, I have one more it. question before, uh, sorry, one more question before the fastball. Before I do, do you have anything? Well, I just wanted to, I'm just curious to know what, what the reaction from the, the folks who appeared in your documentary, how, what, how did they respond to your finished work? You know, that's fascinating because uh, uh, you couldn't be any more scared than I was showing <laughs> the film to people. They had no idea, right? I mean, so they shut up. I got to say, um, there is a uh, Mormon conservative uh, woman who's in the piece who I have a particular affection for. And she's, um, and I was really worried that when she saw the movie, she wasn't going to like it. She loved it. She gave me a hug after the movie, and her husband gave me a hug, and they, they're like, and you know, that was really great, because not everything in the movie is meant to come from, not everybody, I can't imagine we might disagree about certain things if she and I sat down over time, but you know, we share a lot more than we just, than we, uh, than our differences are, and, and I just felt like such a connection with humanity. Everybody loves the movie, you know, who, who was in it, and felt, I think, really privileged to be a part of something that I think their friends told them how uh, how much it helps them to get through. There's a Latino family who's, who's uh, uh, in the film, and they said that their friends say that, thank you, f I wouldn't have gotten to see this movie, and thank you for being a part of it, because you helped me to learn uh, stuff about economic things that I had no idea about beforehand. So all in all, it was entirely positive, I think, and, and you know, it's not always that way, but we were really lucky with this one. Fabulous stuff. Inequality for all. Mr. Jacob Cornbluth, what are you up to next? Is that your fastball? Are we no, there? no, no, no. <laughs> uh, you'll know when it's coming. <laughs> With, any movies coming up out uh, next? 
Right now, um, I just am finishing up a comedy, believe it or not, uh, which is my background uh, with called Love and Taxes, uh, which which is also going to be on the festival circuit soon, and hopefully out next year. Maybe it'll open Tax Day 2016 if I, if we're lucky. And um, I'm working on season two of uh, Years of Living Dangerously, which is the series that you mentioned in your in your opening that we won the Emmy for last year for best nonfiction series and I'm, I'm, I'm kicking around another project with uh, with Robert Reich um, this one's called Saving Capitalism and it's uh, about a book that he just wrote that will be out in the fall and so lots lots happening lots on the lots is on the plate at this time but couldn't be happier that's fabulous Are you ready for your fastball question I, I thought the last one was, so now maybe I'll be uh, a little slow on, on, on swinging, but I'll try my best. So you got a casting director who says, it's your birthday, Mr. Cornbluth. You can pick any leading female actress to star in your movie. Who would you pick? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> any leading female actress. Well, I worked with Mary Louise Parker, and mm -hmm. I thought she was one of the great actresses, uh, uh, that I thought was slightly underappreciated at the time I worked with her, and I still think so. I think she's kind of uh, brilliant. But there's so, you know, it's, it's, I'm about to get trapped in that there's so many wonderful <laughs> actors. How about this one? Any classic, iconic actors or actresses, like a Judi Dench or a Al, Cap uh, Al Capone, Al, Al Pacino? <laughs> Maggie Smith. My voice is affecting my mind, man. <laughs> What about doing a, a, a love story with uh, with Al Pacino and Maggie Smith? Oh, know? there you so, go. Oh, there you but go. You know, at different ages, different times. I don't know. You know, I I can't say who who am I thinking about? Who's the actress? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I was thinking about um, uh, Judy Dench for something. I think she would be great. Uh, you know, but you know, I don't know. As the sort of, I always wanted to take. I like to throw people off and give them sort of curveballs. So. So this is a long answer, but let me try Angelina Jolie in a, in a very serious role. How's that? Oh, there you go. Can't go wrong there with that, go. that's I for can't. sure. So I know people are going to want to see all your movie clips that you have out there. Anything else you've worked on? Where do we go? Well, um, go to jacobcornbluth.com. That's my website. And you can get an entry point into my work. And, uh, and if you're interested in anything with me and Robert Reich's collaboration after seeing the film, please go to Robert Reich. Uh, dot org and check out you can see all the videos that we've made together on the side of his page and hear some more about our upcoming projects together once again thank you mr jacob cornbluth here is the movie inequality for all remember our motto is simple if i can finish this line we'll try it here we go wherever the psychology involved even if you can barely hear me we're there